My name is Brian Skinner. I'm an assistant professor at Ohio State University. That's a good question. I think the first time that I really got into science was as a kid watching like the Discovery Channel, National Geographic, and then I watched I think the Mars rover landing when I was a kid, like the first Mars rover in the late 90s, and I thought it was so exciting that I wanted to be a roboticist. So I went to college with a major in mechanical engineering, thinking I was gonna do mechanical engineering, but I thought the physics classes were just more fun, so I ended up picking up a physics major along the way. And then only at the end of college did I decide that actually I was super bad at mechanical engineering and design wasn't for me. Then I had to fall back onto my physics major, and then that's what happened. <laughs> I mean, I think what everyone who is a physicist loves most about it is just that process of figuring things out. You really love having a problem and then there's this mystery and it keeps you up at night and you pace around and when you hit on an answer, it's so exciting. And that excitement, I think, is what we all get into this profession for. I think it's hard to give one answer to the question, what makes a good physicist? Because you need so many different styles of thinking, so many different approaches in the profession. Like when I was uh, you know, an undergrad, I was very insecure about this idea that like people are ranked on a number line of intelligence and some people are really far to the right, like I, you know, Einstein or Newton or whatever. And then the rest of us are over somewhere to the left and you just wonder whether you're to the right of the cutoff or not. And then eventually you realize that there are many different kinds of intelligence and many different abilities and you're like a vector in some very high dimensional vector space. And so the becoming a physicist is more like understanding what am I good at and how do I use those skills? So, um, you know, there's like ability to visualize things and there's technical ability and then there's sort of very hard nosed, like, you know, being hard to win over and taking lots of, evidence to convince you and then there's being imaginative and so many different skills. I feel like we really need a lot of different abilities, a lot of different tendencies to, to make up this profession. And it's really hard to give one answer to the question of what is important to be a physicist. Like we need all kinds of thinking in this business. Well, I'm, I'm one of the co-organizers of this conference and the story of how I got interested in this business really starts with, I think, uh, a trip I took, I was taking a long airplane flight and I stopped one of those little bookstores and I got this book that everyone was reading at the time, which was a psychology book called Thinking Fast and Slow. It was like a very popular like pop psychology thing that was talking a lot about like two forms of thinking and I thought it was just really interesting. It was written by a very respected psychologist, Daniel Kahneman, won the Nobel Prize. And I got really into this book thinking it was really exciting. And afterward I was reading about it uh, and found that a lot of the things in the book didn't survive the replication crisis in psychology. Like you read anything and the story it's telling is very compelling and there's lots and lots of pieces of evidence, many, many experiments, and you feel like, oh, even if any one of the experiments is unreliable, there are so many others that support the same narrative that the whole thing must hold together. The story he's telling must be correct. And then you read about it and I was just really shocked to learn that the entire narrative had fallen apart, that dozens of experiments independently had been unreliable. And you start to think, how can that happen? And you read about narrative bias and confirmation bias and p-hacking and all these sorts of things. And I started to get really nervous, like, shouldn't it, is my own field gonna have a similar crisis? Uh, are, aren't all those same forces at work in condensed matter physics? And I would try to bring that concern to people and they would say, no, no, physics is very different from psychology. Psychology is a data poor field. We're a data rich field. It's not the same. We have occasional bad actors, but they're very few. And the record is always self-correcting when people make false claims. And I was just like, are you sure? Are you sure that's true? Like this crisis that I'm reading about psychology is really deep and hard to fix. And so I just kind of had an interest starting from there and just would slowly try to bring that concern to people until finally I found enough people who shared that concern that we said, okay, let's make a conference and discuss this issue seriously. So. I'm a theorist, so for me, trying to reproduce someone else's results means like trying to repeat their calculation or maybe numeric simulation and that sort of thing. Um, and in condensed matter physics, you know, a very large fraction of theoretical claims are 
somewhere between correct and incorrect, <laughs> you know, that they're not as general as one might think, or there's some very subtle issue or, so when you're a theorist, you learn to have a lot of skepticism about other theories to really evaluate them critically. And then there's sort of a culture of theorists tend to just take experimental results as correct. And experimentalists tend to just take theories as correct. And we don't apply skepticism to the other side very much. Um, so there have been many times where I have tried to repeat someone's theory and realize that, oh, it's not quite what they're saying. It's not as simple as what they're saying. It's not as general as, as they claim. And that feels normal. I've never tried to reproduce a theory or experimental result, but I have looked at experimental data kind of closely a few times and decided a few times that I don't think it's, I don't think what they're seeing is what they claim they're seeing. <laughs> the question of how you encourage people to engage in reproducibility work or trying to replicate studies is kind of a tricky one uh, because we have a field that rewards novelty that rewards new claims. If you discover something new, you get much more credit for it professionally than if you discover that another claim that was made is not correct. And it's, it's very hard to correct that. Like, it really comes down to what are people excited about and people are going to be more excited about something that's new than about overturning something. So I think there really needs to be a concerted effort to make policies, to make awards for, you know, replication work. Um, and that's part of what this conference is about, what's, what's going to work. It, there needs to be a real effort to reward stuff that doesn't get people as excited, but that's healthy for the field. So we'll see what we come up with. <laughs>
you know, low temperature physics or high energy physics or whatever, have a prize for someone who did heroic work to check a result and overturn it or something like that. Um, I think policies regarding publication and uh, grant review are going to be important. You know, when is a work exciting enough to be published in some flashy journal? We'll have to consider policies. And so a lot of us in this business, you know, you know, individual scientists and uh, journal editors and grant reviewers and grant managers are going to have to consider what's our role here and how do we make it better. In some senses, the problem is so deep that it's hard to, like, the problem is so thorny that it's hard to point to one thing. I think one straightforward change is to say, if a journal publishes a flashy result, and another paper comes along and overturns that result, then it should immediately be considered to have the same level of publishability. So if something gets published in Nature that makes a really dramatic claim, and someone else comes along and disproves that claim, Nature should immediately consider that it's worthy of publication in Nature. That's a simple thing. Um, there are much deeper issues about how we evaluate people for hiring, for promotion, um, and those are tricky and I'm not sure how to address them. Our reliance on publication metrics is in inter for, for professional reward costs a lot of things and co costs us a lot in this profession and I'm not immediately sure how to fix that. Yeah, I think there are many instances of people refusing to share data. Um, I'm not sure why people refuse to share. I think share their data. I think there can be different reasons. Sometimes the reason can be as simple as it's a big burden on the students that like you want me to go and prepare specially curated data for you and I'm not going to make my student do that and spend a week of their time doing it. Um, sometimes people refuse to share data and materials because they feel like they have some inside advantage in publishing that they don't want to give away. They don't want to give away their meal ticket to publish more nature papers or something. Uh, but again, I'm a theorist. I don't know all the reasons why people decline to share data or materials or methods. Yeah, the question of how to make condensed metaphysics more open is one that we're here to discuss, and I only have vague ideas. But I think it would be important to sort of have a, a standard or a best practices for how much information you share um, when you publish a result. So if you're going to publish a result in physical review, it would be nice for the physical review editor to say, this work looks great, we're happy to publish it, but you need to make sure you're sharing all the following information. You need to make sure your data is publicly available in a repository, that your methods are at least this detailed, etc. So I think we should try to establish best practices or standards for what should be shared in publication. And that's part of what we want to do in this conference, actually, is to make, make a specific checklist that we consider to be best practices. Personally, when I'm going to hire someone, a graduate student or a postdoc, I, I look for a few different things. Um, certainly you want integrity. You want someone who is going to be loyal to the truth above anything else, above, you know, success and some other metric. That's very important. You don't want someone whose work you can't trust. Um, I personally want to see someone who has a degree of independence, who doesn't need problems or ideas spoon-fed to them. You want to see someone who has ability to work independently, to generate ideas, to follow them. You don't want someone who respects you too much, because if someone is very respectful to you as a boss, then anything you say, they'll overturn their own thinking. You want someone who ultimately trusts their own thinking. So if I say some idea, they will distrust it and try to argue with me until they find that I'm correct and their own ideas are incorrect. You don't want someone who you have a disagreement about some scientific idea and they immediately go, oh, you must be right and back down. You want someone who will, you know, push against what you say until they're convinced. <laughs> That's important as well. In practice, physicists are only really accountable to each other. Um, they only have this system of you know, gaining prestige in the eyes of others or losing it. So if I am found to be pushing bad theories, ultimately the only cost is that I lose respect amongst my peers and they stop inviting me to conferences or review my papers badly, etc. So 
that's different from the question of who, to whom should physicists be accountable. Probably we should be accountable to the public who's largely funding our research. Um, but in practice, it's very hard for the public to evaluate whether our research is good or a worthy use of their tax dollars. So mostly it's just a sort of informal system of prestige and respect that keeps us in line. It's hard for me to judge whether physics as a community is improving or declining with time because my own career is still relatively young. It's, in condensed matter physics, it's certainly hard not to look at you know, the heyday of semiconductor physics from maybe say the 50s to the 80s as some amazing time that I missed out on when things like you know, a quantum Hall effect was being discovered or all these, all these beautiful results, Anderson localization. And, uh, it's hard to feel like I missed out on something and physics was, was moving quickly in that time, is no longer moving as quickly and there are a million papers that you can't keep up with and it's hard to tell whether they're reliable. So I, I don't have good perspective. The past always looks golden if the, you're talking to the right person and I can't tell whether I trust, trust my impression of it. <laughs> no, there is, a good, there is a good version of the question of what from the past do we wish we could recover? One thing that I understand clearly from people in the past is that the pressure to publish wasn't the same and wasn't as intense. That you could publish one or two papers per year in physical review that were very thoughtful um, and were deep and were not trying to make sensational claims and that was a respectable career and many of the best papers in condensed matter physics were of that type. Um, but now, I mean, if I published one or two papers a year in physical review B, I wouldn't have gotten the job that I got. Like I would not, my career would not have survived. It was important for me to publish many papers with famous co-authors in flashy journals in order to have a scientific career. And so I wish we could somehow recover a system of rewarding fewer but deeper papers rather than many papers with flashy claims. And I don't know how to recover that system. Like you want to have a meritocracy of some kind. And then it's not just an old boys club of people pointing to so-and-so and saying, oh yeah, that person's great despite their shoddy publication record. I don't know how we get it back, but it would be nice if we did. Yes, I do. And my, I, I do have hope that physics can improve its practices. And that hope comes largely from watching what happened in psychology, how in some sense they were a house on fire with suddenly everyone realizing that all their best results were not reliable. And there has really been a concerted effort in that field to change the practices of doing experiments, of reporting them, of pre-registering them, of making the science open, the data open, of encouraging big results to be replicated. And I have hope from seeing that field and how it corrected itself or is in the process of it correcting itself that we can improve our situation in condensed matter as well. I think my overall issue is that when it comes to reproducibility work, it's very easy to point the finger at a few bad actors to say, oh, the problem is that there were a few fraudsters or a few people acting in bad faith and we just need to find those people and cut them out and we'll all be fine. And the truth is that I think the issues that plague condensed matter physics and most scientific fields are quite subtle and they come down to how we what our career incentives are, what we reward, what we fund, who we hire, um, what we publish. And I think addressing those issues is possible, but it's going to take a concerted effort to look at the problem and who can make a, who can make a difference in the problem and how. Uh, so it's going to be a subtle and a long effort, um, but I think it's worth making and I think we can, we can do it.